welcome everybody. Um, that's a pretty impressive uh, introduction to live up to. But uh, <laughs> I, I start off by saying it's been a challenge, but it's been one of the best challenges I've faced in the past couple of years in, in implementing feed management. But what we wanted to talk about today is our certification program to get nutritionists certified to write the plans and then also touch on a little bit of the challenges that we've seen over the past two years of our implementation. So I can't go any further without uh, introducing my, my partners in crime, as Joe did, uh, Virginia Ischler from Penn State. She's a nutrient management specialist and also the dairy complex manager. So she's putting this to use every day on the job. And also Rebecca White. Uh, she was on the national team with Joe when, this, when they developed all the materials. And without those materials, our program wouldn't be what it is today because we have directly taken those materials and built our program. So with that, what is feed management? As you know, every conservation practice standard through NRCS has a code, so practice 592. And really what the purpose of this standard is, is to manage or manipulate the quality of available nutrients fed to livestock and poultry for their intended purpose. So we're looking at rations and trying to achieve production and performance with those nutrients that were being fed. In Pennsylvania, especially on our financial assistance, we're looking at focusing on dairy and beef, while the whole practice standard in general will apply to all species of livestock and poultry, we're looking at implementation on, on beef and dairy as we see we can make a, a big impact on that. So where did it start? The national Feed management standard was developed in 2004. In 2007, the core group for the Mid-Atlantic Regional Water Program saw the need to really embrace this as a, as a practice that can improve water quality. So there was a great partnership and collaboration between land-grant universities, Penn State, University of Maryland, Virginia Tech to name a few. Uh, CREES played a big role in that. EPA was even involved in it, as well as members from USDA. So from that development of the program in Pennsylvania, we specifically started with certification trainings. So we were inviting certified nutritionists to come to a, a workshop and take the ARPAS exam to become certified because there's actually a memorandum, memorandum of understanding between NRCS and ARPAS to administer the program. So in Pennsylvania, between 2007 and 2011, we had this training in eight locations. And again, at the end of this training opportunity, the nutritionist could actually take the feed management exam through ARPAS and will hopefully pass that exam and become certified. Uh, from the time that we have done this up and through uh, 2012, we've had 296. That number's actually increased since last year. We're more like 206 or 316 individuals have come through our program. And this number is going to change a little bit. I just looked at the ARPAS website this morning. A couple people dropped off, but you can see 81 of 98 who are certified on our ARPAS website actually came through the Pennsylvania training program. So we have a, a good track record in getting individuals certified. So once we have those plan writers certified, then if a farmer gets a contract for feed management, in Pennsylvania we require that nutritionist not only to be ARPAS certified, but be qualified through NRCS. We want them to have a basic understanding of a, of a, of a feed management plan. So we have a mandatory training that they come to, and the benefit of that is they learn how to write the plan, and we give them the tools. So there's Excel workbooks that we give them, and we also give them the materials and they get a, a great opportunity to ask their questions and go home with the materials that they need. To become qualified, they have to submit two plans to NRCS, uh, mainly me, and we look at those for technical accuracy. If they, if they meet that, then we deem them qualified. And to date, actually this number has gone up. We now have 25 qualified plan writers. All of them are in, in qualified in, to write dairy plans, and five of those have also gone to the next step for beef feed management plans. Uh, contracting feed management, it's, oh, as we're talking about, we're trying to find ways to get farmers to implement this and adopt this technology. Because a lot of times we're seeing that, you know, they're, they put a lot of faith in their nutritionists and they're looking at, uh, they think that because the milk check is where it's at, they're paying their bills, it's, it's doing a good thing. But we had to figure out how are we going to get them to improve their, their operations. So, uh, we looked at uh, going on a group basis, 
So now a producer can come to NRCS, sign up for a contract, and they can enroll up to one to five groups. So it's a physiological status. So in the dairy production, peak producers, average producers, dry cows, heifers, um, and beef operations is going to be used, uh, cow calf pairs or or feeders, whatever whatever they come up with, and then they can sign up for one to three years. So they can either just get their feet wet, or they can make a commitment to it. And the payments that we that we provide to the producer is to help offset the cost of implementing the plan. So they're going to have a cost involved with the plan being written, and then the testing. We require feed feed analysis, manure analysis, and then you know through the implementation of the plan, there's going to be costs. So. If they're looking at a phosphorus reduction, they may have to change feed sources, which may have an increase in feed cost. The, the costs that we provide are, help to, are to help offset that. Or if they need new infrastructure, we've seen where farmers have bought new TMR mixers, where they switch from a component-fed herd to TMR, so they've used that money to offset the cost of the new mixer. In 2011 was our banner year, our state conservationist Denise Coleman really put a, an effort in promoting feed management. So in 2011, we had 51 contracts across the state, 47 for dairy operations and four for beef operations. And as you can see from the map here, we had a pretty good uh, covering across the state. And the neat thing is looking at the animal densities per plan. So we have anything from a small operation, 24 to 200 animal units, all the way up to some large farms that have 500 to 1,500. So again, but you can see they're pretty much in the Chesapeake Bay water bit, uh, watershed, but again, you know, pretty good sign up in, in this first first big run. So what are we looking for in the feed management plan? What are we expecting the nutritionists to do and what are we expecting the farmers to implement? What we're looking at is actual versus formulated. I think we all know if we deal with livestock nutrition, what you put on paper doesn't always get fed to the animal, it doesn't get presented to them. So we want them as a precision feeding program. So we're looking at them to track uh, actual versus formulated. And then we're also looking at them, looking for them to look at nu nutrient utilization efficiency. So in lactating dairies, we're gonna track MUN levels, dry matter intake efficiency, uh, nitrogen efficiency. As I mentioned before, in covering the cost of the plan, they're gonna have a nutrient analysis cost. So they're gonna look at, if they're not already testing forages, they're gonna do a, a, a quarterly test on forages. They're gonna test the TMR. If they're a component fed herd, now they are gonna be required to test every, every forage in that mix, plus the grain mixes, plus the minerals. Make sure they're actually getting the nutrients that they think they're getting. And also the, the grain mixes and mineral mixes. And then from there, they're going to do an assessment on nitrogen and phosphorus using the, the Excel workbook that was developed by Penn State to uh, get an understanding of where, the, where their efficiencies are. So for, on this presentation, we're going to look at how phosphorus, we're going to show a little bit of the first year of implementation on a, a select farms, but you know, we pay a lot of attention to f phosphorus because that's something that we can track, we can monitor that through rations, we can monitor it through manure. On the, on the nitrogen side of things, you know, we can track it through efficiencies, but really it's so volatile in manure, that's why we're not really looking at that uh, from the manure side of things. But again, we're going to compare the rations to the TMR presented, make sure that we're within a, a specified range, use that spreadsheet uh, on a component fed herd, so if, even though they're feeding those components, they can put that information in, it's going to composite that into a TMR value so they can see how that adds up. And then we're also going to use percent of requirement as a way to track and, and guide us in how, how we should make, be making phosphorus uh, reductions if need be. So again, are they within that 90 to 110 percent of requirement? So this graph shows us we picked out TMR fed herds because we had good analysis between actual versus formulated, we had the ration, we had those TMR analysis. And what you'll see here is actual versus formulated, and the, the green bars are, are that degree of accuracy we're looking for. So we actually want to see a 0.03% difference. That's the maximum that they can have. So what you're seeing here is, you know, just in this first year alone, only six, over almost 60% 
or we're outside of that acceptable range. So again, was that something in variability in the feed source? Was it a sampling error? You know, that's all something that, you know, this was new to them that they needed to look at. What may look as, as a good thing, 45% were below formulated levels, but unfortunately that wasn't planned. That's just the way things shook out when they took the, the, now, the TMR analysis. And the other thing that, that, that concerns us a bit is that we had 15% of those herds that were, they were actually over than what they formulated. So again, is it a variability in feeds, sampling error, but all things that we need to take into account. Yes? How did you come up with the 0.03% as you're trying to be within that window? Yeah, you know, when we're looking at precision, it's... Um, uh, I'm just curious, because I, I, do, I do a ton of feed analysis, and if I got that close, I would be jumped in. I mean, mineral analysis is so challenging. And, you know, I mean, generally, if we're within a tenth of what we actually think is in the diet, we feel pretty darn good about it. Uh, but, just but because. We've heard that we know we're doing precision feeding. Yeah. We can meet that. Okay. So I actually think 0.03% is pretty generous. So the fact that we're getting outside that, it is concerning because the herds that are actually implementing precision feeding are coming almost right on the mark. It, and is it 0.03% so, these units? Yes, so if they formulated for 0.4%, yes. that's 0.03 above or 0.03% below. So that's 10%. Yeah. yeah. So that's an absolute 0.03%. And, and sometimes we can see this difference may just be in percent dry matter sure. alone. And then some of it, can it, we do have, you know, if there's a lot of byproduct, we have that variability issue. But at least it gives them something to work towards. And, and in fact, we have seen farms be able to tighten that up because they're doing more testing. So. And that's all wet chemistry. What we have found is some of this, they were doing NIR and they switched to wet chem, and it, and it did improve. So uh, I think they're, we're starting to see the benefit of, of utilizing wet chem, specifically on minerals. Otherwise, I, I would leave that data. Right. So again, it's been a great learning process for us. It's been a great learning process for, for the nutritionists as well, but absolutely we're seeing wet chem is definitely the way we want to go. And then in terms of the fecal phosphorus on those rations that are being fed, uh, the guideline that we're looking for is we want fecal phosphorus to be between 0.55 and 0.85%. Now that range was developed by some work done by Jim Ferguson and Bob Munson from University of Pennsylvania through a, a Pennsylvania CIG for feed management. So they tracked uh, the rations and made this, gave us this range that seems very acceptable if we're feeding phosphorus levels to where they're where they need to be. So as you can see here, 34% of them were outside of the range and 23 were over and above. So again, you know, it, it leads us to start looking at, are we having sampling errors? Are we having uh, availability within, within the livestock? It, again, stuff that we, we're all starting to question and need more information on. So what are the next steps? You know, the next steps, once they implement that plan, we're not looking for constant reduction. We're looking to, for them to get to an acceptable range and then maintain. So the nice thing is, in the early on, if the farms are where they need to be in terms of these ranges, all they have to do is maintain. But over time, if they start out high, we're looking them to ratchet down as they go along. And we're not looking for immediate, they don't have to make a huge reduction right away. They can use multiple quarters to achieve those reductions. So again, we want them to maintain implementation. So most of those plans that were contracted in 2011 are now two years through, and we have a couple older contracts that are wrapping up. So again, we've got a wide spread. We're also evolving our plan writing workshops. You know, again, we've learned a lot of what information the nutritionists need, so we've, uh, we've adapted our tools, we've adapted our resources. And there's still a high demand for training. We still have the nutritionists coming to the training, wanting to uh, get involved in the program. And in, in 2012, we had 13 nutritionists come to our, our, work, our plan writing workshop to become certified. As we went through this, again, I said we're two years into it, but we're starting to, we started to see an underlying issue something that was making us scratch our heads. 
we start to see inconsistencies with the, reserve, with the results observed in component-fed herds. So, as we mentioned, component-fed component herds are where they're feeding each individual ingredient separately versus putting into a TMR. And what we were seeing is fecal peat was trending higher than expected. So we weren't sure if that was a sampling technique, again, was it an availability uh, function, but so Ginny Beck and I came up with a, a survey and what we want to look at is on component fed herds, was there something about feeding order that was going to solve this puzzle? And also we wanted to look at and identify realistic fecal pea levels for these component fed herds, especially in, in lactating groups and the various heifer groups. So we looked at six farms across the state. Uh, we collected manure from five groups. Our, our study sites were northeast Pennsylvania, two in central Pennsylvania, one in northeast, and two in southeast. Uh, we split our lactating herd into two. We picked uh, the peak producers and the average producers. Peak producers were 20 pounds higher than the average. And the way we did our, we, wanted, we also wanted to see if there's very individual cow variation. So we looked at pulling samples from five individuals, and then we used, we composited those five individuals. And that was just on the lactating only. We just wanted to see intakes versus milk production, would we see some variability. And then we looked at younger calves, because those can be a challenge. If they're feeding a line run product, grain product, phosphorus levels can be pretty high. And we're seeing formulations high, we're seeing fecal phosphorus high. So we wanted to see, again, was there availability issue or is it just over, over supplementation. So we looked at these younger calf groups, post wean cows, breeding age, and bred heifers. And now also we wanted to uh, verify our sampling technique and procedure. So uh, Rebecca and I became the official manure collectors and we made sure that we did it the same, same way each time. We were on the same page to make sure that there wasn't any variability in that. So what did we see looking at fecal pea uh, across the six farms? Uh, yeah, it was quite surprising to see that uh, fecal pea was within that range for most of the farms. Uh, what was amazing was in the, between the average and peak producers, uh, even though they were supplemented higher levels of phosphorus in the, in the ration, fecal pea tended to be in an adequate range. Uh, again, dry, the, the heifer groups were the same thing. We saw rations formulated on the high side, but yet again, fecal phosphorus was in an acceptable range. You know, farm six is an outlier. Uh, not quite sure what that is. Uh, it could be a testing error, could be a management issue, but when I went back and looked at the da data, their formulated levels were in line or even lower than some of the other heifer groups in this study. So again, it leads us to believe, is it, was it a, a sampling error or is there something with that, with the management in that group? Which of those uh, six farms had the highest milk production, whichever board? Actually, they were pretty uniform across the board. Our average producers were right around 70 pounds. I think the low farm was 64.6 and our high farm was 90, was 90 but it, essentially they were at, at 70 and 90 across the board. And we verified that through DHI. Well, uh, just to follow up on that, what we found in Wisconsin is um, high milk production, high efficiency of phosphorus secretion in milk. So, um, so if the high producing herds are putting 30% of their feed phosphorus in milk, so if the animal's not storing phosphorus in its bones or anything, it's got to come out in it has to come out in feces. So actually, if fecal phosphorus is actually the efficiency is, is, is the diet, okay, if dietary phosphorus is 0.35, fecal, and, and you're getting 35% efficiency, so you analyze the milk, fecal phosphorus has to be, has to be 0.35% uh, times 1.35. That's, that's, that's the basis for the animal. So, um, so those that are getting, so, so the efficiency that phosphorus, so if you know milk phosphorus, and you know fecal phosphorus, you're gonna get dietary phosphorus. I mean that's, there's, you know, there's nothing else there. Because I was wondering if that was somewhat reflected in the heifers. Yeah, we know the efficiency of pea in that, and they, in a sense, luxury 
store phosphorus in their bowl. They have to. It grow. gets to grow. Yeah. 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 And then what we also looked at is, you know, we were also seeing that nutritionists tend to love to work in, in percentages versus our actual grams. So what we looked at here is we broke out our heifer groups and our lactating groups. You know, obviously lactating groups are the, the, the dark squares, heifer groups are the, are the uh, diamonds. But looking at, you know, grams per day, again, you know, it's a, it, again, it's just amazing to see we've had some, some you know, calculated grams consumed at, at just above 60 grams all the way up to over 120 grams, but yet fecal phosphorus remained in that acceptable level that we were looking at. And again, um, on, the, on, the, on the individual heifer groups, the same thing. We were seeing that you know, where you're seeing that phosphorus incorporated in the diet, it's a little bit higher, especially for those younger groups. But again, they were actually maintaining an average, an adequate fecal K. But again, you, know, you see those outliers, and I think we know which farms those have come from. And then looking at, in terms of requirement, uh, we actually broke it out, uh, went, expanded a little bit further, went from 80% 80, 80 to 120% of requirement, and compared that to fecal peel. Again, you can see that, again, even when they're feeding over 120%, we were having farms with fecal phosphorus within, within acceptable ranges. So again, is it an availability issue? Is it a, you know, again, it's giving us some fuel to look at, you know, what do we need to understand about uh, phosphorus utilization and availability in dairy cows? And then we also want to look at, well, how, was, how, was the, how were these six farms comparing to a couple of the farms that we have under contract at the same time? So again, looking at our six farms, just on the lactating cows, again, in grams per day, all of them were basically in the range, but yet on our, our contracted farms, we had a few that were outside, and again, that's, we're not sure if that's an availability issue, a sampling error, or what, but again, it gives us something that we, we're realizing we have to look more at to really solve that, the puzzle. So with that, I'd be happy to take any additional questions. Any additional questions for Dan? So, um, are, uh, are they feeding multiple diets on these farms, the lactating cows, based on days of milk or...? Uh, the average cows were getting a base ration, and then most of them were getting a top grass or an additional, or they were just upping the amount of grain mix. But the, the base forages were about that. Yeah, because what we, uh, again, what we have in Wisconsin is if, um, so the higher end farms, higher higher milk production, the higher phosphorus species, you see, they may have four feeding groups or two feeding groups. So if you just kind of did a sample of fecal phosphorus with the whole herd, you'd get no relationship. But if you could go to the barns and get um, fecal phosphorus from the individual feeding groups, then, then the uh, um, relationship is much, was tighter, I mean, much tighter. Right. And, that, and that's where we had luxury here. It was component fed, so they were on a tie stall. So we actually picked our samples based on the DHR, so they had individual cow data. And that's how we picked who to pull the samples from. And then when we grabbed for heifers, we tried to get as many fresh grabs as we could. Sometimes heifers, they wouldn't cooperate, so we did have to pick up off the ground. But we tried to get identified fresh. Even if we did pick up, they were fresh. They were, it was nice that one day it was 12 degrees, and, as long as it was steaming, we knew it was fresh. Yeah. But again, we tried to identify the individual cow that we that we grabbed those samples from. Great project. Thank you. Yeah, and one thing that we did notice, and then you have to keep in mind the staff, because we have one farm where um, so you know we have individual farms, male and individual cow groups, and if I could composite. Well, one farm, the um, composite sample. because this, uh, this stuff is just fascinating. So, um, you know, we talked about wet chemistry versus uh, uh, near infrared. 
Now, if, if this is going to be incorporated into a, as a management tool, um, you know, we, we've got to get away from the web chemistry. That, that doesn't give, you know, that's, that's not part of the, uh, the information that farmers get. So solving the NIR problem is important. Um, and then I have one more question is, have you used milk urea as a proxy for food protein being fed? We were, and that's one of the things that we do in our plants is we do track MUNs to see, you know, protein efficiency, and also that's one of the things that we're starting to see is are the nutritionists looking at carbohydrates as well? You know, a lot of them are fixated on crude proteins and soluble proteins, and they make adjustments to that. But then MUNs are 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 trending the way they want. But again, they haven't looked at fecal starch. They haven't looked at starch digestibility to solve that piece of the puzzle. We took Uh, one of it is just equipment on the farm. Uh, you need to make a TMR, you need to have a big mixer that you can mix the individual ingredients. So a lot of it is that they're, we have a lot of plain sack farms enrolled in this program, so they don't have the storage capability. So a lot of times they'll, they'll do a, a component bed and we do have other farms, but it's mainly equipment. Okay, okay. and additional questions, um, catch them at the break.